Hallelujah. God is so good. All righty. All right. So if you won't take up my time, I won't take up yours. I got my timer running. Praise God. It's good to be here. Amen. Amen. And, you know, um, as I was praying and seeking uh, wisdom this week, um, it, it was amazing how God's word just kept coming back up in my spirit. We need more change. More change in the way that we live this this amazing grace. Um, how do we do we really represent the Christ that went to the cross, the Christ that was raised from the dead, and does He live to the fullest in us as we live this life? Yeah, we we're going to have trials, tribulations. We're going to have all the hard stuff. We're going to have all the good stuff. But how do we? How have we changed or have we changed from who we used to be into the new creation that God has, uh, has created in us? And are we seeking after the destiny that he has placed on our life? Or are we still trying to just get through life the best way we can and Jesus hurry up? Well, the title is, I'm going to continue with what we talked about with Abraham and and Sarah last week in Genesis, because I think it has a very important message for all of us that it wasn't just their names that was changed. It was their destiny that was changed. Everything about their life changed when God became the center of their name. Remember, it was Abra, Abram and Sarai. Sarai was barren. She couldn't have children. She's 90 years old. Well, at 90, guess what? We all know she can't have babies. That's just the natural way things are. But see, when God came into the middle, when God revealed himself to Abraham and Sarah, Sarah got pregnant. Sarai could never have a baby. But Sarah became pregnant and had a son. And so I just want to continue sharing this, this message of real importance because at a time as we continue on where we are going in this world right now, we are going to endure some difficult times. Plan on it. And it's not going to get easier. It's just not. If you read any part of the Bible... The messages to the people of God is that this day is coming. The end times are coming. And we are the last generation. I'm telling you, we're the last generation. That doesn't mean that we're okay. I'm, I've got my fire insurance and I'm waiting on Jesus. I'm ready to go spend eternity with him. Well, so am I. But until he, until he comes, as long as he tarries, what are we doing? How are we living this life? Do they see Christ in us, the hope of glory? Or do they just see another claiming to be Christian, but seeing no change? And this is what I want to focus on again, is this change that must take place in every believer. Our country is beginning to see, listen. Our country is beginning to see the word of truth in these end times. Because they don't know who to believe. They don't know who to trust. And, you know, we've been sharing all these years, 2,000 years, we've been telling them there's an end coming. There's a time coming when God's people are going to be raptured out of here. And shortly, seven years later, there's going to be another thing that's going to happen so mightily, so awesome that people are not going to be able to take in his grace. It's, it's that mercy of God when Jesus comes to set up his kingdom. But in the meantime, that kingdom is living in each one of us. 
the power of living God, the word of the living God, the power of the word is in us. Not to sit around and wait for Jesus, but to go out and do the work that Jesus called us to do. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel and make disciples. And after you make disciples, then baptize them in the Holy Ghost. See, that's what Jesus did. Jesus went out, preached the gospel, and then he made disciples out of the 12. Start, uh, there was 12, then there was 72. Then it went back to 12. And then after Jesus left, it grew to 120. Woo. That started, all this started with 120. And that's just amazing to me to see where we are today. But what I'm looking on is that the change that took place in that upper room, the change that took place in those 120 lives will never, ever, ever be the same. They'll never be the same. They always were on the move, always on the, the growth, the change, allowing the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, to change their every step, change their life. I want to go where you want me to go. I want to be who you want me to be. That's the change. God has changed us and given us everything he needs us to have. Eric was sharing this morning. And it's all about what he needs us to have. He's already provided. He's given us everything we need. You don't need to go to theologian school. You don't need to go to here or go there or whatever. You need to know who you are in Christ Jesus and let Christ live in your life, through your life. And he will reveal all that you have that you never knew you had. He'll change your life. God didn't just change Abraham and Sarah's life. Are their names? <laughs> Sorry. He changed your life. <laughs> Believe me, he changed your life. They no longer spoke the same. Sarah never turned around and said, I can't have babies. How can we have a son? How can we be the father of many nations? How can I be the princess of nations? I don't have any kids. Boy, well, when God gets involved, when God steps into their life, change takes place. When God steps into our life, change takes place. It has to. But we need to be willing servants. We need to be willing people to say, here I am, use me. Here I am, change me. We are confessing in, um, what are we confessing in our difficult time, in our difficult hour? As we're going through this, what are we confessing? What are we speaking? Remember last week I gave you that word, uh, um, homolegio, homolegio, yeah. That's a tongue tire, but it means to speak the same or to speak the word of God and speak what God says, not what we think or not what we've heard before, that that was only, the, that was only for the apostles. All we're supposed to do now is go out and preach the gospel. Well, no, that's not what we're called to do because all you got to do is open up the Bible and look at the words that Jesus said in Mark 16, 17. He said that those who believe, these signs will follow. He doesn't say disciples. He doesn't say apostles. He said those who believe, these signs shall follow. So in other words, the same thing that he did, we should be doing, and they should be seeing it with such amazement that they're drawn to worship and praise our God. See, that's why Jesus did what he did. So that his Father in heaven would be glorified. Just as he did with Abram, Abraham and Sarah, God has a destiny plan for each and every one of our lives. And we must choose. Everything is a choice. See, that's why I, I love about the way God did things. See, we all think that God, well, God needs to do what God needs to do. It's just like the song that, that uh, Sharon sang, hold me up. I believe in all that, hold me up. But then when God reveals himself, reveals the message, what are we doing about it? We must choose to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit and the word of God. What does the word say? That's all I'm concerned about. What does the word say? And if the word says to do something or to go someplace, are we willing to do it? We must be committed to Christ as he is to us. 
See, there's that song. Jesus saves, hold me up, amazing grace. We have all these beautiful songs that just, just make us feel so good. They even brings tears to our eyes. But five minutes later, an hour later, we're right back doing me. I'm right back doing what I used to do. And then when somebody sings that song again, oh, what an awesome song. God is so good. But then we walk out the door and bam. We must be committed. Listen to me. We must be committed. That's why I sit here and I stood here this morning and said, where are your friends? Where are your loved ones? Where are your family members? I hear there's a darkness that's setting upon this country. You're the light. I'm the light. Why aren't they following and seeking the light? They complain because it's 104 degrees. But it doesn't keep them from the lake. It doesn't keep them from the campsites. It doesn't keep them from the fishing hole. Not condemnation. Just think about it. How important is God who is now centered in the middle of your life? Is he the one of importance or is if it still me? We must know and understand his word in order to know his will for our life. See, this is, again, this is something I, I minister to, I, I share with you all the time. I hear people all my life, well, I, you know, what's God's will for my life? Read his book. You know, in order to figure out how to put the key in your new truck, and, you know, uh, um, Connie, we were talking yesterday, and she's talking about all these gadgets, and she kept telling them, haven't you got a truck that just a truck? I don't want all these gadgets. You know why? Because you got to get in the book, and you got to read or have somebody show you all the gadgets, how they work, and so on and so forth. What we become is a society that doesn't want to have to read about it. We just want to do it. I don't want to have to practice singing. I don't want to have to practice doing what I do. I don't want to sit down for hours every day and read the Bible just so I can preach for 40 minutes on Sunday morning. But guess what? If I don't, I ain't going to get her done. And not only that, how will God respond to me when I cry out to him or I call out to him for that amazing grace? What would be his response? Are you finally speaking to me? You must want something. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 22. I'm only going to be here for a few minutes. We never, we didn't get this far last week. Um, we, we were more into chapter 17 where it was where God was changing their name, changing the destiny of their life, that their lives would never, ever, ever be the same. It would not be the same. God had a new plan, a new destiny, a new change, and, a, and, a, and he was going to equip them uh, for what he needed them to do in order for all of his plan of life for you and I. Just think if, if Abraham and Sarah didn't do what they were supposed to do, we wouldn't be here. Because through Abraham and Sarah came the bloodline that led to the Messiah and the teaching of the word and the, and the word of God came through this bloodline, came through this people, and now we have it. We have all the goodness of God, the favor of God, the knowledge of God, the wisdom of God. And there came his son. And now he turned around and made us a, an opportunity for a new destiny of life. So look at verses uh, 7 and 8. I only want to go there for, for right now. <clears throat> and, and again, this is, this is time that's passed. And if you look at verse 1 there, it says, God tasted, tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he said, here am I, Lord. <laughs> I love this. Listen, God spoke to Abraham and he said, here I am, Lord. How many times has God spoke to you this week? And you went, here I am, Lord. And he says, hey, I need you to go do this. Really? Moi? Me? Little old me? I can't do that. Anyway. So, but he said, here I am. 
and he says, now, look, if you look at verse 2 quickly, it says, and he, God said, take your son, your only son. What a word from God, your only son. Well, of course he's my only son. He's the only one you've given me. And you gave him to me. I couldn't have him on my own. You gave him to me. And now, you're, now you want me to do something with my only son whom you love and go to a land, uh, the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering. Can you imagine this? Just think on, ponder on that for a minute. Now go to verse seven. Here we are after this time, they've already left home and they're on their way to Mount Moriah. And then all of a sudden, something takes place. Isaac, his only son, spoke to Abraham, the father, and he said, my father, and he said, Abraham said, here I am, son. And he said, look, the fire, the wood, but where is the lamb for, the burnt, for a burnt offering? Now watch verse 8. And Abraham said, my son, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering. I don't know if you've ever seen this before, but this is so important that we look at this and what Abraham said. We picture on the things he said when, when he took his servants with him and they got off of their donkeys and, and they're about ready to head up the mountain to, to go to do the sacrifice part. And Abraham said to his servants, stay here. The lad and I will go yonder, but we will return. Now, listen here also what Abraham is speaking. This is homologio, speaking what God says. And Abram said, my son, God will provide for who? Himself. Not a lamb, but for himself a lamb for the burnt offering. So the two of them went together. So as we read through this and we understand this, we see here that God will provide. God will provide as we choose to follow God, as we choose to listen to to his leading and his teaching. God will provide. Two weeks ago, the title was Jehovah Jireh. My provider. That's his name. And now he's saying here, I've given you a son, your only son. Now take him and sacrifice. Can you imagine in that moment what you might have thought? how you would be feeling inside. Now, you got to understand, this is not 10 minutes after he was born. Abraham's been playing baseball with him and shooting hoops. <laughs> He's been spending a lot of time with his only son, his, his own son, that he had to wait to 100 years old to be able to have his own son. And all this time, he's been raising up Isaac, and he's so excited about the life of Isaac and the things that God is going to do. Because God told him that I will put it, he is the seed of the nations to come. God made a covenant with Abraham. Do you know your covenant? Because God made a covenant with us too. So Abraham didn't say God will provide a lamb. He said God will provide for himself a lamb. I believe Abraham knew exactly what was going on and what was expected of him. I believe that because of the fact that he had a covenant with God. And God cannot break a covenant. He can't do it. He can't lie. His word will always accomplish what he set it out to do. It will never come back to him void. It can't be broken. If he spoke it, it is. Put an explanation point right after that. Abraham wasn't just, when he was talking to his son Isaac, he wasn't just bluffing when he said, well, yeah, God's going to provide for himself. Why didn't he say, you're it? He was going to slay Isaac. He knew that, and he was willing to do it because he had a covenant with God. 
you got to get this word. This, this covenant is a spoken word covenant. Jesus said that he is the living word. God gave us the living word. And everything that goes with that word is ours. That's a promise. That's a covenant with almighty God. And it can never be broken. It can by you and I, but it cannot be broken by God. But Abraham knew this covenant. And he was going to. He was ready. He brought the knife. He knew what he was going to do, no matter what. But there was something else that was going also in his mind, was his covenant and God's promise of who Isaac would become. He set a destiny for Isaac. And how could Isaac accomplish the destiny if this was the end of his destiny on Mount Moriah, on a stone um, platform and being sacrificed? Is that it? Look at verse 17. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Go to Hebrews. You've got to see this. Go to Hebrews. You don't have to hold your place there in Genesis. We're not going back there. Hebrews chapter uh, 11, which is our faith book. And look at verse 17. We're going to look at 17 through 19. This is why I want you to see this, because I believe this is the Apostle Paul's writings. We don't know for sure, but though just the way he speaks, the way he responds according to faith and everything, I believe it's him. And most people do also. But look what happens here. He's talking about Abraham. This is the book of Hebrews, or this chapter of heroes. Heroes, 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 heroes <laughs> of faith. Now watch this. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received, now listen, listen closely. He who had received the pros, promises offered up his only begotten son. Remember that covenant he has with God. This is the promises. Look at verse 18. Of whom it was said in Isaac, here comes the promise. In Isaac, your seed shall be called. All of this that I told you about the father of many nations, all of this will come through your son, Isaac. So he has a promise from God that Isaac is the way to the nations. Now watch. Verse 19, concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead. Now watch. From which he also received him in figurative sense. What is it saying there? He was already dead. He couldn't have a son on his own. So how did he receive Isaac? God raised Isaac from the dead. From his dead body and from his wife's dead womb, God came into that, that connection and became a part of their life. And he fulfilled a promise in himself. Remember what Abraham said up there? And God will provide for himself a lamb. Isaac wasn't the, the lamb. But God had a plan from the beginning, as we know from Genesis, that he said, I have a, I have a, a plan in, in, in line for man to save men from themselves. But I love this about this, concluding that God was able to raise him up. And he had already received him from a dead womb, from a dead man walking. He couldn't produce. She couldn't produce. So where did he come from? God raised him from the dead. That's what it's saying there. So it's saying that from he also received him in a figurative sense from the dead. But he would still obey God, even in the understanding that he is going to sacrifice him, that the promise, the covenant promise of God is that everything will come through Isaac. And yet God is saying, sacrifice your son, your only son. Was Abraham willing to do it? Absolutely. He came prepared to slay his son. And that's why he told his son. He also told his, his uh, men servant, he says, we'll be back. Man, you talk about faith. You talk about trust. The key to Abraham's faith was the... <clears throat> sorry. 
the key to Abraham's faith was the way he thought. This is why I'm teaching and sharing this message because it's how we think about things, how we think, how we ponder on the word of God. Are we, when we're in a situation where we're uh, under attack, when we're uh, a sick or we need a healing, how are we attacking that? How are we going about uh, choosing our way through this time of testing? Is it through the word, the spoken, the homilegio, the spoken word of God, or is it what I think in my soul, man, on what is the best route for me? See, what I need to do is, and this is what this is showing us, Abraham did, his thought process was, God will do what God's going to do, but I have a covenant. I'm going to do what God tells me to do, but I have a covenant. Abraham had spent 42 years focused on God's promise. You got to go back all the way. It wasn't just the age of of Isaac, it goes all the way when the beginning, when when um, God called uh, Abram and said to leave your family and all your friends, leave all of that and come and go to a place that I will tell you. This all took 42 years. And yet here we are at this place called Mount Moriah. And now he's asking him to take the promised child and slay him. This is the truth, the true faith of the spoken word of God. Abraham knew one way or another, his son is going home with him. No matter what goes, what happens up on that mountain, that boy is going home with me because I have a covenant promise from Almighty God. His word said, he said to me directly, this will be your son who will be the seed of the nations to come. And there again, what does the word say to you and I? You and I? Jeremiah 1.12 says this. It tells us, for I, God, am ready to perform my word. God's spoken word. In the Amplified, it says, for I am actively watching over my word to fulfill it. Not just to speak it, but he's waiting to fulfill it. And he'll fulfill it through you and I. We have seen the same kind of faith operating in some of God's men throughout the, the Bible teachings. And one of them that is uh, one of our favorite and one that really proclaims um, the anointing of God is uh, a David. Turn to Samuel chapter 17, 1 Samuel 17. We must, listen to me, it's very important. That word must is not a word to take lightly. We must trust the spoken word of God. You cannot go through this life without trusting, having faith in what God said. We need to check out our next witness of faith. And his name is David. Look at verse uh, 26. I didn't even turn there, but I got it written down. 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 26. Did I say 6? I meant 26. 17, 26. Okay, and then David spoke to the men who uh, stood by him saying, What shall be done for this man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach of Israel? But listen, listen to this. For who is this, listen, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of God? When I read this this week and last week, I'm sitting it because I had this all ready for last week, but ran out of time. When I stopped to think about this, and this, this, is, this is coming from a, a young man that had an encounter with God and how God changed his life. See, this is what I'm looking for. Where are the changed people of God? Where are the changed people? We claim to be changed, born again, a new creation in Christ Jesus. Where are the changed people? How did this land get to where it is now if we were changed by the presence of God, the blood of Christ, and we now walk in his power and authority according to his word who has destined us to be 
the people of God, how did we end up where we end up? Well, Gerald, did you read the Bible? It said these things will happen. Well, I know they're going to happen. I understand that. But what have we done to stop it? What have we done to stand up against it? Don't answer. Just listen to what David and a few more principles, uh, people of faith, have to say about this. David said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of God, of the living God? Who are they to come against us? We are the people of the living God. We are born again in the blood of Christ. We have the power. This country was built on the promises of this word. And we have not been doers of the word. And we have the evidence. So don't we, we don't need to be standing going, oh my. How am I going to afford the next tank of gas? Sorry, didn't mean that as condemnation. It's just a word. David said, who is this uncircumcised? You've got to know what this means. But we're going to talk about it in just a minute. Now listen. When we go out and we speak the word of God and we stand for the word of God, I know, Debbie and my wife, we know what it's like to be ridiculed by your families for what you believe. Watch what happened to David. David's no different. Verse 28, David's brother got angry with what David said. And then he turned around, hey, why aren't you at home watching the sheep? That's your job. Who's watching the sheep? Why are you here? You just wanted to come here and see the battle and you're just getting involved in something that you have no understanding about. I'm paraphrasing. But that's what he was telling him. You don't understand. You don't belong here. No matter what people may say about you or how you believe in, the, in God's spoken word, how you believe in God's spoken word, they will speak against how you believe in God's spoken word. God spoke it. I believe it. Period. It won't change. Just because we think it should, it's not going to change. We're to change to the word, not change the word to make it fit our life. That's a good word there. It says, no matter what people may say about you or what you believe when you speak the word of God, hang on for the ride. When I was reading that and when I was putting that down, my brother's song came up, just welled up in my spirit. Hang on for the ride. You know what? That's what we need to do. Hang on for the ride. No matter what comes tomorrow, no what, matter what comes tomorrow, this afternoon, no, what com no matter what comes next six months or after the elections, I want to know what the word says in my life and I'm going to live it today. Hang on for the ride. God is faithful. Listen, listen. God is faithful to his word. You want to know what God's going to do next? Read his word and then speak it. I'm going to talk some more about that. Not just his brother that gave him a hard time. Look at verse 33. This is, oh, hey, this is his king. That's going to speak next in verse 33. Saul, King Saul. This is the king speaking. You're not able. You're but a youth. God had no problem with David's height or his age. You know why? Because he knew David's heart. And whatever God told him to do, David was going to do it. And if he did it once, he'll do it again. David, uh, did David accept, accept what the king had to say? Absolutely not. Look at verse 34. This is his response. This is his response. A lion and a bear stole a lamb. I'm the guardian of that lamb. My father put me in charge of those, of those sheep. And one came, they came and tried to steal it. He, and he says that David went after it. Note, how was David able to stand against all the negative things that they said about him? He cited the times when he killed the lion and the bear. Why? That was his testimony. 
See, God was there. God showed him what to do, how to do it, how to take care of the problem. And he took the lamb right out of the lion and the bear's mouth and brought it back and put it back in the group. And so this is what he stands on. He cited the times when he killed. He had proven God is faithful, failure to trust God. He never failed to trust God. And prove him in the small things will guarantee that he'll be there in the big things. Look at verse 36. Your ser servant has killed both the lion and the bear. And this uncertain, man, he's got no problem with this. Because we got to know what he means. And we're not talking about the foreskin is gone. It says this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them. They're going, he's going down just like they went down. This uncircumcised, he has no covenant. Circumcision was a proof of a covenant of God. David kept calling him uncircumcised. He has no covenant, but I do. I have a covenant with the living God. So the confidence, listen, the confidence of David in the faithfulness of God's word. That's where you and I need to be. We need to understand that if God spoke it, it's mine. The uncircumcised was the, confidence, was the reference of, of Goliath not having a covenant. The enemy will be overcome through God's ability, and God's ability is greater than any problem or weapon that will, you will ever encounter. Do you believe that? I'll say it again. The enemy will be overcome. That's the first thing we need to focus on. He's already defeated. We know he's already defeated. Overcome through God's ability, not mine, not David's. David already knew it won't be through my strength or my size or my knowledge that I'm going to beat him. But my faith is in God who's always been there for me. I have a covenant with God. He doesn't. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Oh, where did we ever hear that? And every tongue... Listen, listen, and every tongue that rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. That you is capitalized. God will condemn, not you, not me. Man, think about those promises. All I have to do is stand in faith. All I have to do is speak the spoken word of God. Homologio, speak the same thing. Sorry, I'm yelling again. We would never have to have heard of David. Listen, you'd never have heard the story of David if he went out and killed a midget. Because anybody could have done it. A little guy. This one was a giant. He's, he's, he's almost 10 foot tall. And probably as broad as this uh, podium here. I mean, this guy was huge. And no wonder he was laughing at David when David came out there. But do you remember what David said? Today, you come after me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin. Oh, listen, people, listen. But I come to you with the God of Israel, the God Jehovah, Jehovah, my provider, my strength, my avenger. He's already defeated you and you're coming down and I'm going to chop your head off and parade it through town. The Lord who delivered, listen to verse 37. Oh, why is this thing jumping around? Hang on. Verse 37, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Why? I have a covenant with God. I have a promise from Almighty God. He did it once, he'll do it again. All I have to do is stand firm on his promise, on what his word said. There was no tangible proof that David could beat Goliath. Think about that. Did we have any proof? 
prior to us reading the word and reading past that? Was there any tangible proof? Everybody, his brothers and even King Saul said, you can't do this. You're just a kid. Well, these are trained soldiers, trained men, and they're afraid of him, but yet you're not. David says, no, I'm not. I have a covenant. So you need to know, Saul, you need to know the covenant. Because you have a covenant just like it, but you need to understand you have a covenant with Almighty God. You walk in his power, not your own. You walk in his stature, not your own. You walk in his strength, not your own. Woo, come on. David, or a Goliath's weapon was carnal. What was David's weapon? Come on, you're going to go against this big guy with, all this, with, a, with a Gatling gun? I'm just, you know, with an AR-15 and all you got is a slingshot? Yeah, because see, you see the carnal, you see the natural thing, but I am coming from a spiritual position because I have a covenant with Almighty God. Look at uh, chapter 4 of Hebrew. Or you don't have to go there. I'll read it to you. It's one we all know, 412. For the word, listen, listen, the word of God is so that, that little pretty word, you know, it's like that word I talk about if all the time. If is a choice. You choose. Which one are you going to do? Sharon shared this morning with her song. She quoted um, uh, Chronicles 7, uh, 714. If my people, that first word, if, that's a choice. See, if we don't, God's not going to hear from heaven. But if we do, so that means we got a choice. We either do it or we don't. You choose. But listen, for the word of God is, this is pointing exactly and telling us exactly what the word is. All we have to do is speak the word and let the word do what God intended for it to do. I don't care what people think about you. I don't care what people say about you. You just quote the word. Watch, for the word of God is what? Living and powerful. I told you, y'all know it. And sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing even the division of the soul and the spirit, that's the natural and the supernatural, and the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Oh, glory. That's good stuff. Back over there in 1 Samuel, verse 47 says, then this is part of David's confession. The battle is the Lord's. It's not mine. He showed up before. He's going to show up again because he told me to do it. Okay, after seeing what, da, what God did with, with uh, uh, David, you don't have to go there. I'm running out of time. Daniel chapter 3, 28. Okay, after seeing what God did, this is what it says. Nebuchadnezzar, remember King Nebuchadnezzar? He spoke saying, blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. Man, that's some powerful words right there. Blessed be the God. See, it was all about him. That's why he built the statue. It was all about him. You will bow down and worship me. You will do what I tell you to do. Sound familiar? But what did they do? They stood up. We will not bow a knee to you or any of your gods. We trust in the one true God, and we will not defile him. You want to kill us? Go for it. Do your thing. I know, I'm paraphrasing again. Do your thing. But when it was all over, listen to the words of this sinner, this man who was so, so enthused in making himself a God. Listen to what he says. He said, blessed Man, I want people to hear this. Your God is, you're, you, you serve a blessed God. Man, he blesses you in this. He blesses you in that. That's my God. That's who, that's who he is. That, that's his name. All those things you said, that's who he is. Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants, who trusted in him. That's the key word. They trusted in him. I know. 
They trusted in him. It didn't matter what the king was going to do. It doesn't matter what certain people in high authority are going to do. My trust and my faith is in the word of God and the word of God says, and I speak it out of my mouth. Let the word defend me. Let the word do what God sent it to do. The only thing the fire did was burn off the things that bound them. Oh, come on, people, listen. The, only, uh, the fire that we're talking about is the power of God's word. See, when we live in that fire, when we live in that position of knowing who we are in Christ Jesus, out of our mouths we speak authority and power. And what happens is those things that bind us are burned away from the word. We all, you know, the, the word here says angel and it's even capitalized. We don't know if it was an angel or most of us have been taught and we all believe and, and think it was Jesus in the presence. It, it doesn't matter. What matters is God showed up because they stood faithful to his word. They had a covenant. Faith in the word of God defies all the nature, all the laws of nature. It defies all the laws of nature. Now that doesn't mean we go out and break the law. Because God's law is bigger and higher and more powerful than our local law. That's not what it's saying. Because see, if you break the law, you're broke, broken God's law too. Then we have another example of speaking the word of faith. Jesus. You remember when he's walking down the road and he was hungry? And he looked up ahead and there was a fig tree. And it was ripe. It was ready. And he got there and there was no fruit. Now watch, listen carefully, and don't dare think in your mind, well, that was Jesus. No, what he did is he spoke the word of God. Remember, he only did and said what his father told him to do and say. He spoke the word of God. Not only did he speak to the tree, he turned around and he kept going. He didn't wait for that tree to die. You ever think about that? See, if we do something like that, we're waiting for the result. Jesus didn't. Faith in the word of God, trust in the word of God. My spoken word went forth and it will accomplish what I sent it out to do. Let's go on to Jerusalem. But they got the evidence the next day when they came back. And the disciples all excited. Hey, master, master, look, that tree that you cursed, it's dead. I could, I could just imagine, I know Jesus probably didn't say this, but. You go, yep. Did you expect, did you expect anything less? I didn't. He said it. Listen, he said it. He released it. He believed it. And he confessed it. Bam. Done deal. See, it's the same thing. We take the word of God, we live the word of God, we speak the word of God, we release it and put it out, let it do what it was supposed to do, and we're just going to keep on doing what we're doing. See, if you're waiting on a feeling, get over it. If you're waiting on the miracle, get over it. First of all, we've got to be in a position to trust God with all of everything that his word says that he is. We've got to believe it. Okay, you got to go with me here. Go to 1 John, almost all the way to the back there. 1 John chapter 5. I know I'm taking a little bit long. I blame it on your hugs. Only because I can. <laughs> if you have to leave, go ahead. Look at verse 14 of chapter 5 of 1 John. It says there, now, listen, listen, now. Not someday when you become wise in old age with lots of gray hair. Gray hair doesn't mean you're wise in the word. But anyway, it says, now, this is the confidence. See, this is what I believe we've seen in David and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They had confidence in their covenant with God. Do what you got to do. I have a covenant. My faith is in God. But watch, this is the confidence that we have in him, in Christ, that if we ask anything according to his will, in parentheses, I added his word. His word is his will. He hears us and he hears what? 
He hears his spoken word. Verse 15, and if, there's that word, that questionable word, if we know or if we know we have confidence, he hears us, whatever we ask, we know. Are you seeing these words? See, these are all positions of confidence, knowing who we are in Christ, what God has already promised through his word, which is his will. See, if we live according to the word, we fulfill the will of God. There's our problem. We're still trying to do it the old Frank Sinatra way. I did it my way. Anyway, so whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions. See, do we act with that confidence? That's the important word here. The confidence that when I ask or when I pray, I pray with confidence according to the word of God, which is his will. And when I speak it, do I know it's going to happen? Or am I waiting for a feeling? Well, I don't feel it. I don't see it. So it must be God's not listening. Remember, he said it first. God spoke it. If God spoke it, his word going out and will not return to him void, but accomplish everything he says it out, He sent it out to do. You've got to remember that. And so therefore, we have to have that confidence. It's his word we speak by faith in that word. When Jesus uh, and his disciples returned the next day, the, the fig tree was, was dead. It's not a feeling, it's by faith. See, he didn't just feel it was going to happen. He knew it was going to happen because he spoke to the tree. And here's the confidence that we have in that. That tree wasn't dead from the outside where the leaves, like my garden is doing. You know, where you see the evidence, the, the, tr the leaves are starting to turn yellow and then they turn to brown and you're going, is it too much water? Is it too less water? What is the problem? See, it wasn't on the, uh, there. What he said, what, what, what they noticed was this tree was dead from the roots. Not from the outside, the visible. This was from the bottom. They seen this thing dying from the bottom up. We see things die from the top down. Ooh, who can stop you from reaching your destiny? Think about that. Is this where I'm going to end? Who can stop you from reaching your destiny that God has planned for you? He's already got it laid out. It's already there. There's only one person that can stop you from reaching your destiny. It's you. It's me. I was going to go to Numbers 14, but I'm not. Um, this is when the, I'll just tell you about it. This is when Caleb and uh, Jacob went out with the other 10 and went and spied out the land and came back and the 10 said, oh man, all we seen was the giants. Hey, everything that God promised is there. It's huge. It's great. It's sweet. It's all the things God said it would be, but there's giants in the land. They forgot about their covenant. But here comes Jacob and Caleb to remind them of the covenant they have with God. If God promised us a land, we can go take it. Those giants that you're talking about, they're just bread. They've lost all of their defensive power. That's what they spoke. Why? Because the word of God says, I will give you this land and I will go, go before you. Have faith. Know that I have a covenant with you and that land belongs to you. Period. But see, when we start taking things in the natural, we start trying to figure it out in our soul, man, how this is going to take place. Rather than going to the word of God and God says, this is what it is. They were confessing it. See, the other ones were moaning about it. But Jacob and Caleb confessed it. They said, God has promised and God spoke this. It belongs to us. Speak only what he says. Homologio, what did God have to say about your situation? Go look it up and then start speaking it. Speaking it with confidence because it's the word of God and it has to be truth. Amen? Amen? I, I hope you're getting something out of this because, see, if we really are changed, if we are a new creation, 
we will be operating and living this life from a different position. Just like Abraham and Sarah, what a perfect example. They couldn't live that life. They couldn't have kids. They couldn't do any of that. And when God said, I'm going to give you a son, they both laughed. Well, maybe that's what we're doing, laughing in God's face. It's time to change our ways. Get into the word. Know that you have a covenant with Almighty God. He's made promises. Do you know what your promises are? And if there's things that you need in life today, search it out and then speak the word of God. It's living. It's living word. It's not just word in a book. See, that word is already here. God said, I'm going to place my word in you. So now you live from the inside out. Start speaking. Homologio, speak like God speaks. Speak like Jesus speaks. If it's too hard to speak like God speaks, just speak like Jesus. I don't know why you would think that would be easier because they're both the same person. Amen? God is so good. He's given us so much, and, and he, is, he, he never goes back on his word. You know, everybody you know, every, everything that you have, can fall apart, but God will never fall apart. He will never stop be being who he is. See, that's why Abraham could go up there with confidence. Hey, if I have to slay my son, no problem. But I already told them people down there, my servants down there, him and I are going back. Because God made a promise. Man, I could start that all over again. Amen. God bless you. Stay empowered. Stay blessed. Stay anointed in Jesus' name. Be a blessing today for someone that needs to hear that. See that smile of yours? To feel that anointing that is flowing from you? God bless you. We love you. Have a great week.